आई वी एम रेसिपी बुक्स आर वेरी स्पेशल फॉर मी दिस अ डिफरेंट मैजिक इन लीफिंग थ्रू अ पाइल ऑफ कुक बुक्स एंड गेटिंग इंस्पायर्ड टू विप समथिंग अप इन द किचन My mom gifted me Katie Dalal's iconic Jamwa Chalo ji when I got married. She was worried I'd make a horrible impression on my in-laws not knowing how to cook a single Parsi dish. Later, when I started my catering kitchen, I was gifted the latest edition of the iconic Time and Talents Club recipes and also Bhiku Manikshaw's treasure trove, both of which have become my valued possessions. What I love even more than recipe books is to host and attend cooking demos and lunches. I love inviting people to my home to learn Parsi food and I do the same whenever I travel. It's the best way to bite into a big slice of the local culture. Today on the show we have Canada based Nilofa Mavalwala. Her blog Nilofa's Kitchen has a wealth of recipes and stories on Parsi food and beyond, especially a lot of the conti food that us Parsis love to eat. Nilofa organizes a lot of cookery classes and luncheons and today on the show we get to listen to how she created a market for those in Canada. Nilofa has also published The Art of Parsi Cooking in 2016 and is coming out with another book very soon. She tells us about all the blood, sweat and tears that really go into writing a cookbook and why choosing the recipes is actually the easiest part of the whole process. This is Not Just Dansak and now let's chat with Nilofa Mavalwala. So thank you for making the time to be here on Lufa and I'm super excited to have you on not just Dansak. Hi how are you? Thank you for having me and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Great. So Nilufa let's just start at the very beginning. Um what are your earliest memories of food especially around cooking or eating Parsi food? Uh we've always had a family that enjoys Parsi food so I remember growing up uh eating parsi food for my daily meals okay and in fact until i was much older maybe even 18 years of age i did not eat anything besides parsi food oh wow so, so while other people liked to find it as a treat to have something different i enjoyed my spice and meat and potatoes and whatever So I would say I was a pretty good die-hard Parsi food fan until oh. I discovered there were other things to eat as well. <laughs> I understand what you mean. Uh, you know, I grew up in a house where we just had every Sunday was kebabs for breakfast, dansak for lunch, cutlets for dinner, and I just grew up thinking that the rest of the world just ate that every Sunday. So I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> So, uh, Nilofa, yeah. did you have any like sort of set Sunday traditions in your home, like a special meal that you all made every Sunday or something like that? Yes, until I was about fifteen years of age, I remember we used to have dansak uh, for Sunday lunch. Whatever happened, we had to have that. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, it was my favorite, and I used to really, really look forward to it. And when we moved from one area to another for some strange reason that tradition slowly stopped as we grew older and i remember protesting about it for quite a few sundays before i had to give in oh okay. i've always missed it <laughs> yeah. and i wish i wish i could do that here but i'm not doing it okay. so i can't say too much Hmm. And I've always meant to ask you since all Parsi surnames are quite funny what does Mavalwala actually mean uh, My mother-in-law told me that Mavel is a small village in India and that all the family came from there but we are speaking at least 3 generations ago so okay. I assume that's where they came from as in my husband's family oh, okay so it's actually a place and not uh, not something that people used to do because my surname yeah. was daru khana wala yeah. and that actually has nothing to do with daru or khana it's actually owners of a gunpowder factory which i was was quite the revelation for me <laughs> yeah <laughs> so well, my name was vanya and i'm not sure uh, where my ancestors came from but oh. also from Surat and Navsari and all these places. Okay, great. So, Nilofa, when did you start your blog exactly? Like, can you share how that came to be? 
Yes, uh, it was very interesting, actually, the blog. It was an idea that was created because people used to call me every day to find out something about how they could uh, proceed with their daily cooking or anything that they had learned in my class and they wanted to try out. And once I felt that I had this daily stream of inquiries, I thought to myself it would be fun if I could put it down in a blog. Okay. And this started November of 2013. And it got very exciting, also challenging, because you can't really have a food blog without pictures. Yeah. And every time I thought of putting something up, I had to create it again and take a picture. Yeah, that's actually one of the biggest challenges so of food blogging that I've found as well. Um, yes, absolutely. You know, because most absolutely. of the time I'll make something but, and it will be for dinner and then the lighting won't be correct. And so I can't take a photo and then I have to make it again for the blog. So it's quite the challenge. Correct. But there is a way out. The thing to do is not to wait for the blog. You keep clicking as and when you can. And then you kind of fit it in. And that's what I found works better. Also, I got so taken up with the food photography hmm. that I started taking lessons. And when I took the classes, I really felt much better about the pictures. And I love it. It's my new passion, my new hobby. And I would encourage anybody who's trying to do a food blog or write a cookbook to try it out themselves. Yeah, it just gives you a newfound appreciation. Like when I look at some of the food photos I've taken back in 2013 when my blog started as well, I just cringe at uh, what I thought was a good photo and <laughs> what it is now. So. I agree. I agree. Even I do the same thing. I think, oh my God, did I really think this was beautiful? <laughs> Great. So, uh, Nilifa, you did cooking demonstrations in Dubai where you first stayed and then also in Canada. And this we're talking is long before online platforms were around and, you know, before social media was like such a thing. So how did you used to get people to come for these classes and pay you for them? Uh, so in Dubai, I did it as a hobby because nothing else. I didn't have a job. I was there with my husband and my family and it was uh, good because they have little ladies groups there and then I had joined one or two of them and then it's just word of mouth really Okay. and it was very successful and mostly I had a group of uh, Hong Kong Shanghai Bank uh, ladies who used to uh, join in. And it was very exciting. You met new people and you taught them things that uh, they never had cooked before. And we used to do not only Parsi food, but they had a love for Thai food. So I used to do Thai food with them. But they really enjoyed the Parsi food. So we used to go between the two. Also, we would go to the market, uh, see the different fish and meats available. So it was very nice. Uh, interactive yeah. and those were mostly cookery luncheons rather than uh, cookery classes right not that there's so much difference between the two but yes and in Canada I came and started to do the same to make new friends more than anything else yeah it's and a great way I of making friends kitchen. I must say it is it is because there are like-minded people and generally, people who attend enjoy food. So the topic around the whole afternoon is about different foods. I always encourage them to tell us a story about some basically kitchen mishap, which always breaks the ice. And it's very interesting. And I really enjoy it even after all these years. Okay. So do you find that, uh, I mean, people are more receptive to it now in terms of like actually coming and paying for it? Like, do you do these as like paid luncheons now? You mentioned that this was more of a hobby yes, in Dubai. Yes, they're not very expensive. Yeah. Um, I don't keep them very expensive. Uh, they're very affordable. 
uh, and mostly it's like more a little bit more than your share that would come up and i have maybe uh, i decided this a long time ago but i don't generally take anything in advance i know that it's not the done thing generally but i don't like to be paid for anything that they haven't learned correct and so i only accept the money after i've oh that's finished. really nice yeah so even if it's interact like a lot of people don't bring cash anymore and they like to send it to me through interact and yep. a lot of people will send the interact before the class uh on their own but i never download the interact until it's done oh that's very and, sweet and uh, that's just one of those things that i feel very strongly about that it's you know just i know it's wrong on their part sometimes when they don't turn up or they've signed in or whatever but for most part i found that people are by nature honest and they'll offer it to me even if i say no they will still offer it to me so i don't have a problem i don't find it difficult Great. So, um, can you tell us a little bit about your e-cookbooks? Like, when did those start? Was that before or after the cooking uh, luncheons that you started? It was during. It was also in twenty thirteen, actually, and I wrote my first book in twenty thirteen August, and I had to learn obviously how to do the e-cookbook and everything, and I remember doing. the quick and easy which is also parsi food because the children were in university or going to leave for university and all their friends kept asking and i thought okay you know let me put this together for them oh that's nice so that they sweet. can download <laughs> it and i still to this day don't know why i didn't mention that it's parsi food Mm. uh because i've written quick and easy and nobody really knows what the cuisine is that was my first mistake right and i feel it would have sold many more if i had actually written parsi food on it okay. but that's my realization now well you live and, and learn and <laughs> um, it was yes you live and learn and it was on kindle and then once i got the hang of it i started putting up other things and Uh now I haven't uh, written any more ebooks uh, recently but I do have two in the pipeline which I am going to put up but uh, it's you know my new cookbook has taken up most of my time so I haven't been able to focus on anything besides that Okay. So actually that leads us to um my next point which was so when did the idea of having a cookbook come about Um you know how long did it take you to put together that first uh, the art of parsi cooking too long i think it was too long but it is not easy to put a book together the easiest part of it is the idea you have to know what you want and how you want everything else will fall into place once you start so i had kept the recipes ready i had kept the photographs ready and these photographs were done by a professional but he was not a food photographer he was a a portrait photographer right. so we struggled through it and he was a friend and to keep the costs down he was very kind and generous about it uh, because he was keen to help me put this project together Mm. and with the social media the blog had started and doing very well and it was through that that i decided that why not give it a shot and the publisher picked me up from twitter oh wow and then i accepted yes it was just by chance like they say Okay because so, I was that was actually my next question you know because I've always wanted to uh, write a book and I've had this idea I've been mulling over for the longest time but this whole publishing process just seems uh, so scary and my first thought when I saw your book was uh, you know that you've actually published it in a very international market you know it's a parsi cookbook 
published in a Canadian market. So uh, can you share a little bit about how that actually happened, how the publisher picked you up and, um, you know, from there on, how did you, I mean, how did it actually come into paper? It is a daunting process and it's not easy. And my advice to anyone is that if you are passionate about it, go for it. But through a publisher, don't expect to make money. Yeah, this seems However, to be a recurring if theme. Going to write a series, <laughs> yeah, if you are, it's the truth. Uh, however, if you are going to write a series of books, uh, think about it prior because you cannot repeat the recipes in your next book. So divide whatever you need to divide it into sections and make sure that the first book is published through a publisher because in this day and age, with so much out there, people take you seriously only if you have been published. Right. After you've been published, the next round, I would suggest that you self-publish. My second book is self-published because you have the confidence, you know how many books you've sold you know the process, so have confidence to spend on yourself. Okay. And self-publishing is expensive, but if you feel that you can market it properly, then you should do it yourself. Okay. Now, let's see what my, my results are by self-publishing. Yes. The second book I am self-publishing. Yeah. But... Uh, I think it's uh, always great to follow your passion. Of course. So tell us a little bit about uh, your second book. Like how is this one going to be different from the first? There will be Parsi food in this one as well. There are 51 recipes versus 33 in the other one. The pictures are absolutely fantastic compared to the other one. And while, of course, the content is exactly the same in the sense that the quality of content is 100% tried, tested, shared, you know, to the T, and no difference there, the actual printing will be beautifully done. Okay. Uh, the first book is digitally printed right. to save costs, but the second one will not be digitally printed. It will be properly printed as printing books go. Okay, great. So I'm quite looking forward to the vibrant colors and, you know, the actual uh, book which the printer uh, has promised that it will be of the best quality. Okay, great. So I think we'll just take a quick break now and we'll just be right back. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another awesome week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you are not following us on social media, please make sure you do. We're IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We'd like to thank our sponsors this month, Savari Storytel and Paytm Money. Also, guys, I just want to remind you that we do these audiograms on our social media. Audiograms are short snippets from episodes which are interesting to listen to. Check them out. I think you'll enjoy them. Also, guys, we are doing a podcast with Ronnie Skruwala called the Ronnie Skruwala Podcast. And on that podcast, on the last episode, we're going to have Ronnie answer a bunch of listener questions. If you'd like to send us a question, please send it to us at dreaming at ivmpodcast.com. Also, do check out our YouTube page where we have Ronnie talking to Cyrus on Cyrus Says. We have a bunch of short clips there which I think you'll enjoy. This week on Shunya One, Sheila Ditya and I are joined by Hitesh Malhotra, the Chief Marketing Officer of Nika, to talk about various aspects of marketing. On Equity Sahi Hai, brought to you by Motila Laswal Asset Management, Shreya Lunkar talks to Anupam about life insurance and what the product is all about. On the Habit Coach Podcast, Ashton tells you different ways to manage and control stress and how it will impact your life in a positive way. On Know Your Kanun, Umber talks about the structure, power and characteristics of the recently passed Lokpal Bill. On the Prakati Podcast, Anand Arni, ex-member of RAW and Pranay Kotastane, head of the Geostrategy Program at Takshashila, discuss the upcoming election in Afghanistan. On Advertising is Dead, Varun is joined by Harshad Chavan, Managing Director of Toast Events, to talk about the growth of digital media, influencer marketing and the famous Gap Dabbawala campaign. On the ATKT Talent Tent, hosts P-Man and Krupa are joined by singer-songwriter Naila Saldana. They discuss the strict dress codes followed by colleges in India. 
on Positively Unlimited, Chetna talks about different aspects of relationship, unrequited love, heartbreaks, closures, and how to find your soulmates. And with that, let's get you on with your show. Welcome everyone and we're back on to Not Just Dhansak. Today on the show, I have Nilofa Mavalwala and we're talking all things um, writing about Parsi cookbooks for an international market. So Nilofa, we were talking about your second book and I'd like to ask you, you know, how is writing for the blog different from writing for the book? Like, do you end up having to test your recipes multiple times? You know, how is it very different from doing it for a digital space? Uh, blogging is more fun because you kind of write a story with it or uh, you just share that day's experience and you can write whatever you feel because you know that you can go back and change something if you need it to. Right. And uh, it's very, very casual. I love blogging. And um, the proof is that it's, successful by the readership so I have a readership of almost half a million now Wow! and it's an automatic flow so it's even more uh, fun it's become more interactive people do ask you questions and stuff like that yeah. uh, which I enjoy yeah uh, so it's very relaxed versus when you go into print you have to be a thousand percent sure about the mistakes. I'm not worried about the recipes per se because they are tried and tested already over and over and over again. And if you are not 100% sure, you would do it again and again. That's one part of it. Writing a recipe is the hardest part of sharing a recipe, especially when you cook through your mind's palate, like I've always done. Right. Uh, very rarely have I opened a book and cooked. And I've been cooking daily food for many, many years. So something like Ras Chawal, which I might have made a thousand times, when I have to pen it, takes me forever. Oh, did I put that? And how much did I put? And so mm -hmm. you have to kind of write the ingredients down. And you have to go back into the kitchen and make it sort of exacting into teaspoons and tablespoons and cups. And then you write all that down. So, and then you try it again. That did you write it correctly? Right. So it's very, very tough because you don't want to miss out something. Yeah. And editing is also very, very important. And the editing is really the most painful part of writing a book. <laughs> if I just had people who would take over, I would be able to write many more. Yeah. But, uh, like I've had on this book, uh, three editors, wow. because in the last one, the publishers also had made a couple of errors. Uh, but because it was digital, they could go in and change it for me when I was, you know, upset with them. Right. They could add anything they wanted to even later on. In this book, I won't be able to add anything later on. Right. So I have to be a thousand percent correct for every full stop, comma, dot, you know? Yeah. I mean, so and it's hopefully really, yeah. there are not too many mistakes. Great. So, I mean, it's really commendable that you're going the self-publishing route because like you said, you know, the onus like is all on you, not even just, it's not about just testing the recipes. It's about doing each and every aspect of it. So I'm really excited to read the second book. Um, so moving on. Thank you. Even I'm very excited <laughs> myself and I'm looking forward to it. And when is it launching? I have set the date for July of 2019. And right now, the lady who is putting it together for me, the creative director, Zara Contractor, uh, she's working on it. Okay. And once she's done, it will go into printing. Okay, great. So um, moving on from the book, you know, 
It was um, when I was doing research in terms of what to ask you for this show. Um, Hindustan Times recently did an article on the infamous Time and Talents Club. And you've actually mentioned their Willy Auntie, who was instrumental in the club, is actually also your mentor. So could you share a little bit about what you've learned from Willy Auntie when it comes to Parsi food and maybe some stories from her about her time with the Time and Talents Club? Sure. So besides my mom, who obviously I grew up with and she still lives with me, who's an excellent, excellent cook, my Willy Fui has been a huge part of my life. Uh, and she used to visit Karachi. She lives in Bombay and she used to visit Karachi off and on and stay with us for a couple of weeks, if not months, each time she came. And because she was originally from Karachi and used to teach in the mama school where she used to teach cooking, uh, people still knew her. And every time she came, she was requested to give a class. So obviously the class would be in our home and I would be so excited to be her sous chef. Oh, wow. <laughs> and when she would do this, I used to thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy it. And she used to pretty much trust me to be able to do whatever she kind of instructed. She never once second guessed that because I was too young, I couldn't do that. So I learned how to cut a chicken with scissors or, uh, you know, debone a fish or things like people go to school for. Right. And it just came very naturally to her. And I learned that it came naturally to me. At that point, I didn't make deal about it because, you know, it was just one of those things that if you're interested in, you learn automatically. Right. So every time she came, we used to make sure that she had a class or two classes, depending on how uh, long she would be staying. And they always did fancy things. They were Parsi food because uh, she could. So there would be asparagus mousse or... Her favorite was a roulade, which I still love making. Yeah. And uh, stuff like that sort of got introduced, you know. Okay. And it was a very exciting time. And then I guess because I'm so very fond of her, I must have decided in my mind that, oh, I'm also going to try this, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and I did. And that's how it all started. But to this day, person, I am on the phone with her uh, or I've, actually skyped recipes because she just chitty chats about it she's oh. <laughs> not actually got a book or she hasn't ever written down anything right. it's all in her mind she's seven years old but it's all in her mind so when she discusses anything with me when I ask her about the recipe for the book or anything like that that should I add this or should I add that, she'll just you know talk about it and then when I try something I've actually kept her on the Skype and shown it to her. Do, do you think it looks okay now? Or do you think it looks <laughs> perfect this way? Or is it this color? Right. And it's it's just been a very interactive, uh, you know, sort of, Yeah. I would like to say, friendship more than anything else. Yeah, so my dad gifted me the Time and Talents uh, book when I started um, my business, like started moving from blog to catering. And it's one of my most... Uh, treasured books so I'm definitely gonna go back in there and hopefully there might be one or two recipes that I can find that Willie Auntie has contributed there which I can try out myself but I just love what you said because yes, I think she has. you know what you said about like um, this generation having such a big wealth of knowledge but I feel it's really important that we actually capture that and you know and record it. So it's really amazing that you're trying to do that with your recipe books and your Skype calls. And that was one of the main purposes for me with my blog as well. Because my mom does the same thing. She's always like, you know, just add a little bit of turmeric powder. And I'm like, how much is little? Like, is it a teaspoon, a tablespoon? What is it exactly? So, um, yeah, I really feel that it's important as a community that we, you know, document these things and also importantly, share it with other people. Correct. So here I would like to add something, if I may. So my mother, who's also actually kind of uh, family with my aunt, is exactly 
the opposite. She has recorded every single thing in exact measurements in handwritten books. Wow. And it is because of that that I have been able to actually have the energy to reproduce some of the recipes, which would be very tedious otherwise uh, to start from scratch. So it's a sort of a combination between my mom's very well-kept diaries and Wilfrey's hands-on approach yep. that has given me the best of both worlds because you can't do it one way or the other. It has to be both. You have to be able to uh, chip and chop and change without feeling that you'll spoil it. But you also need that guiding line. So it's been there for me and I can refer to it. I can taste it. I can test it. I can do whatever, right? Yeah. So both the things are there. And like you said, it's so important to share And now that so many people have come to North America, I just realized that there's a whole generation of kids, Parsi kids, who have no idea about our food. Forget going into the vegetarian section, (laughs) even rush chawal. They have no idea. And that is sad. It's just sad because our food is so healthy. Our food is so well-balanced. Our food has so much nutritional value in it. So why not give it to them? Right. Uh, I I just feel it's very important to record this. It's part of our heritage. It's part of our culture. It's part of our tradition. And there is a storyline behind most of our foods. So share it with them. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I was looking at an old uh, Parsi recipe book um, and this one was completely in Gujarati. And um, it's so hard, like, you know, I wanted to make something of it, but it, you know, it tells me like, uh, use two ananu coriander. And I'm just like, I have no idea how much coriander you got for two anas. <laughs> so like, how much is that? Is that a bunch? Is that a tablespoon? Um So I think one aspect is the sharing and then also trying to make it, like you were mentioning, as relevant to the person cooking the food. Like they should not get too daunted by the recipe itself, you know, and be able to follow their instincts and kind of make it how they think it will end up. Correct. You have to cook also a little bit from your taste palette, which is in your mind. And if you can... Look at it as art. If you can look at cooking as art, like you kind of build the picture, right? In layers. So you are building the flavors in layers. And there is no right or wrong. If you just dislike some taste, omit it. It's your family, your taste. But first try it. Then if you don't like it or you dislike it, then you can always omit it. Hmm. So... I I still feel that uh, while it's our duty to share everything, you don't have to just put everything into everything. Just make it your own, create it, have fun with it. You have to eat, so you might as well eat the best, right? Right. So enjoy it, share it with your friends, your family. And it's always fun to do that. So that actually leads me to an interesting point. Um, You know, you mentioned that there's more and more Parsis living in the US and Canada. And dhansak actually seems to be on its way to becoming like an international dish. You know, I read, I found this one recipe which had uh, pineapple rings in the dhansak. And then there's another famous UK chef who's made one with dates, tamarind and pomegranate. And... um, I was part of this Parsi Facebook group where someone posted a link to this recipe and everyone was like really horrified, you know, like how dare you put pomegranate seeds on top of the dhansak. So my question to you is, you know, like authenticity versus like innovation, like is there a line one needs to toe or is everything like, okay, you know, when we're talking about innovating? Well, my personal thing is change is inevitable, but there are certain things where the Taste factor cannot change if you call it something. Right. So while 
I have also changed the dhansak from using, say, three pots and pans and, uh, you know, doing it all separately to doing it in one uh, pot and pan. And the flavors and the tastes are almost identical, I would say. I've done it in a way where it looks the same, it tastes the same. Right. So that is also change. And I've done it with the idea that people don't get daunted by the children when they open books and see a whole, you know, sort of five page recipe, they're not going to do it. Correct. But you can't put pineapple in dhansak <laughs> and then expect people to accept it as dhansak. Call it something else. Yeah. Call it something else. There's no problem. But don't force it down other people's throat to say, no, this is dhansak. It's not. Right. And I have seen it myself, and this is my own pet peeve, that they have printed a recipe as dhansak, which is like a lentil stew with cubes of vegetables. Ugh. Uh different lentils and I can never ever accept that as dancer and I actually wrote to them saying that you know is this a mistake is this an error and they all seem to have ghost writers so nobody answers you right and it was sad however I also blame the community for not taking a stand on these things uh, the same thing happened with a Persian recipe Last summer, the Sainsbury magazine put up a cover picture of something they called uh, Persian food, which was incorrect. And the entire community went up into arms until Sainsbury had to give a public apology. So not to take it to that extent, but at least you have to acknowledge when you are not in the right. Yeah. So I still feel that we should protect our things. Now, I can see where the Cameron and data are coming because we do have a chutney uh, in the West that we use uh, for Kattu Mittu, right. which is Cameron and date chutney. And yes, I can see that going in uh, for the Kattu Mittu. Uh, pomegranate is just that little addition of color or whatever. I mean, but... That part is doable. The tamarind and date, I don't think, is incorrect at all. Right. Uh, but I don't know. The yeah. pineapple thing doesn't uh, yeah, really... I think let's draw a line in the pineapple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not putting pineapple in my dance. Yeah, let's draw soon. a line at that, yes. Yeah. So just to yeah. end, um, one of the questions I like to ask everyone who comes on the show is, um, is dhansak really your favorite dish? Or like if you had one last Parsi dish that you could have before you died, what would it be? <laughs> yes, actually, as long as it's properly prepared and it has to be meat for me, mutton, right. lamb or goat, not beef, and it has to have bone in it like you can't have boneless meat in dansa <laughs> because it's the flavor right from the bone and uh, kachuvar and nice caramelized brown rice right yes i think i would very very firmly say that it is my favorite oh. and i'm not just saying it because i'm on this show but it always has been and i think it will always be because so far nothing has come quite close to that oh lovely great so thank you so much Nilifa for taking the time to be on the show and it was lovely chatting with you and I wish you well for your upcoming launch of your upcoming cookbook and I can't wait to read it and try out some of the recipes so thank you so much thank you for having me and it was a pleasure and I look forward to chatting again soon one day great thank you bye bye Do you have a night routine? Well, everyone has one. And the to-do list usually looks like this. Brush your teeth, set that alarm, get into your pajamas and switch off those screens. But here's one more to add to that list. Tune into the Positively Unlimited podcast for a dose of positive action 
and tips on how to build powerful mindsets. Episodes out every Monday on the IVM Podcast app, ivmpodcast.com or wherever you tune into podcasts. Hi, my name is Anupam Gupta. I'm B50 on Twitter. I am the host of Paisa Paisa, the show that talks money. On my show, I speak to experts from every field of money and finance, from stock markets, equities, debt funds, credit cards, life insurance, every possible area of money and finance that you can think of. We even did an episode on cryptocurrency. I've got fantastic guests from mutual funds to personal finance experts everywhere. Robo advisory startups, just name it, we've got it. At Pesa Pesa, we help you make smart decisions about money. You work hard for money. Now make your money work hard for you. New episodes out every Monday and you can listen to my show on the IVM podcast app or any other podcasting app that you have. Pesa Vesa is brought to you by Paytm Money.